Atheist Nomads, episode 119, special episode on mental health. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo-hahs. Please be advised. We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Hello, everybody. Joining me in studio is my lovely wife, Lauren. Hi, everybody. And joining me in studio is... That's me. It's Meredith. Yay. Mary Barry. I'm, I'm, Yay. I'm Wesley's person. <laughs> Hi, Meredith. I'm your Welcome. person. Hello. I, I know that you've heard a few words from Meredith if you listen to the shows on you know, any regular basis. She's been on a couple. but Very sparingly, normally yeah. from the background. It's not planned. She gave a rant once. You should check it out. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I demand more rants. Maybe today, if, yes. we, if we're right, lucky. So today's episode is going to be uh, a little bit out of the, the usual. You know, this is an odd-numbered episode, which is normally our interviews, and uh, this is going to be the four of us talking about mental health. Um, we all have mental health issues of some sort, and uh, we'll kind of just go through, I guess, basic story, and then just kind of talk about some of it. So I'm going to start since uh if i go last i, I will sound like a well, too normal just put it that way <laughs> uh, uh, so a whiny little pissant came yeah, to my, mind my uh my father uh had severe bipolar and was abusive uh my parents split when i was five uh he disappeared when i was 10 and i only knew that he was alive because i continued to receive disability benefits not survivor benefits from social security. And so only knew that he was even alive until I was 18 and that stopped. When my mom remarried, uh, we moved to Grants Pass with my stepfather, father, who I consider my dad. And I was enrolled in Grants Pass Adventist to school where from third grade on until I was, well, got to about six foot when I was 14, I was bullied continuously. These were two grade classes, about 20 students each. And generally, there'd be about 15 bullies, uh, four girls who would just ignore everything. And then I was the victim. And that continued for years. I was very depressed as a, in my late childhood, early adolescence. And my social development was definitely stunted by that. Uh, when I started college, I started slipping into some mild depression. And I went to a, the, the counselor on campus. It was free. And told him about everything that happened to me. And he was thinking I seemed far more normal and healthy than I should have. And so he gave me the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory and diagnosed me with mild anxiety and mild paranoia. Uh, generally speaking, these are fine. But I have found that if my vitamin D levels get low, the anxiety gets worse. And on occasion, the paranoia can get kind of rough. But last real paranoia spiral I've had was was probably about three or four years ago. And my uh, boss was, well, HR was out to get me at that point. Uh, I have found were they the, really? They actually yeah. were just paranoid. Less paranoia and more legitimate cause of, you know, anxiety and fear. Now, there was the legitimate right, anxiety and fear, which started turning into an anxiety and paranoia spiral. Yeah, those are the worst. Um, I have found that honing my skepticism has helped keep the paranoia in check um, but that does nothing for the anxiety and those two have a tendency to try to play off of each other for me um, so that's I guess my, my basic thing uh, the, the anxiety is, is the more common issue and it I would say like on a scale of 1 to 10 it's normally about a 2 on occasion uh, if life's getting there's enough life change happening it will go up um, so a few months ago, shortly before the wedding, not only was my vitamin D levels very low, which kicked it up quite a bit and you know, getting on prescription vitamin D has helped bring that level down, but just the impending, impending wedding and cost of that, uh, definitely. What are you saying? You, 
you have regrets? <laughs> no, no. I just probably I that had... weddings are expensive. Yeah, it was uh, the money more than anything Not when you else. cut and run like yeah. we did. Yeah. Like, screw you guys. We're going camping, which is perfect. <laughs> which helped a lot. You know, not knowing that we weren't going to have to pay four thousand dollars for a wedding. And right now, my anxiety levels are actually higher than than normal, and that's uh, because of some interviewing I'm doing for a job that I won't go into any further details on unless I get it. Because we can't stop talking about it every it. other aspect of life. <laughs> and we're so excited. All right. So, Wesley. Oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Wesley, tell me about your problems. Should he lay down on the couch first? I don't know. I, I think a lot of mine has always done with uh, my mom and father's divorce. Uh, you know, that, that whole thing about me finding finding out about religion and, and, you know, just being shunned from that community when I was a kid. Uh, and then like the, that, that, uh, really led into, well, my mother got custody of me and that led to like, um, uh, you know, I was a teenager and wasn't always the best one, but, uh, uh, yeah, lots of abuse, lots of shit like that. Uh, physical abuse or, more on the the emotional side physical mental i mean i remember when i was five years old uh my mom thought that i lied to her so she uh gave me a, a tablespoon of dawn dish soap with crushed red chili peppers and told me to hold it in my mouth for for like a half hour and then she Holy finally crap. told me to swallow it okay the soap the soap is a traditional thing i've, I've right. heard of soap and it's usually a bar but well she didn't she didn't, she didn't think the the soap was enough it's cruel yeah uh wow damn i remember uh <laughs> when they when they got divorced my dad used to love to work leather and so he made me this rawhide leather belt it's like i don't know close to a quarter inch thick had a a big old semi belt uh semi belt buckle on it and that turned into the object that my mother liked to beat me the most with uh Holy there was crap. quite a few times that like from the backs of my knees to the literally literally back to my knees to the backs to the to like my shoulder blades i had been black blued and green by that belt like nonstop, all over uh so yeah i've had shoes uh cast iron skillets a whole bunch of other shit thrown at me uh yeah that's uh, uh god was definitely thrown into a lot of that uh for her reasons that she was doing doing this uh that I needed to be a, a good person and that uh, she kind of needed to beat beat the shit out of me, beat the beat the, the devil, the Satan out of me. And beat the fear of God into you. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it's yeah. probably how she was raised, you know. <laughs> That's, uh, abusers beget abusers, typically. Um, you seem to yeah. be a fairly well-rounded, skeptical, logical person, which is the 1% that can come out of that. Well... <laughs> Yeah, I definitely won't say that I came out of it unscathed. I definitely have some depression. I've definitely had suicidal thoughts on occasion. You're not beating Meredith with a cast iron skillet, though, so. Definitely. No, other stuff, but she, nothing. <laughs> um, you know, as it's I recall, consensual. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've been working on this podcast for three and a half years, and yeah. mental health issues for you have only impacted they've, they've, one episode? They've, yeah, they've crept up a, a couple times, uh, but only really bad. One, uh, yeah, I, I try and I mean I know that you have problems too, so I don't I don't talk about mine unless it's like really bad. So, but yeah, and that's kind of um, what we're here for, right? Is the uh, getting over that, um, that talking about yeah, it is yeah. okay. Ca catharsis, yeah, and yeah, totally, you know, and also ten point Scrabble word for catharsis, <laughs> and. That's awesome. So, nice. thank you. How frequent would you say issues pop up for you now? Depression? Um, <laughs> uh, that's always that's always there. Uh, usually at about like a, a two to a four level, I'd say out of ten. Uh, but again, I you know I try and stay strong because uh, well, Meredith has problems too, so I don't want to talk about mine because you know she needs some support. Yeah, but I'm here for you, too, for support. That's how a healthy relationship works, is supporting each other. So just because my issues are worse doesn't make yours Yeah, invalid. Wesley G., stop like, being so selfish. 
Let me help you. <laughs> help me help you. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah, and I may be uh, in a different state, but you know, I'm always always here for you as well. I appreciate Aww, it. Group hug, guys. Aww. Group hug. Um, like internet hug. I'm hugging Rocco <laughs> for you. Oh, thank you. Thank I'm you. I'm hugging myself. Uh, so yeah, de- <laughs> depression. Depression is always there. Uh, generally, not too bad. Uh, suicidal thoughts yeah that much much more rare but uh yeah had those a couple times mostly not i really haven't had those in any major amount in, in quite a while like a couple year and a half two years or more for the most part and have you gotten professional help with any of this no i don't go to doctors for anything i should but i don't Just run it under a cold tap. (laughs) I mean, like me going for the vasectomy is like the first thing I've ever went to a doctor for since like my early 20s. Wow. I just don't go. It's even more infrequent than me. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Wow. And then then there's some people who have co-pays piling up so much (laughs) that they have to like (laughs) take out an entire paycheck for them. No. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I don't I don't I've never done well with doctors. It's not that I fear science or fear anything like that. I just hope not. Don't don't feel comfortable going, so I don't. But hooray, I got a vasectomy. Yay! <laughs> no babies. <laughs> All right. Um well, Wesley, I'm going to have to give you some crap here. You at least need to get a physical. It's if if you general health checkups are important to have yearly. Uh, well, I get I get them with the government for a, for a uh, <laughs> the government for an otherwise healthy yeah. male under forty. I think is every three years you should get a checkup. Uh, um, we actually get yearly checkups. Okay, in the, in the yard. Yeah, yeah. He probably gets what checkups, flu shots, vaccinations. Yeah. Um, and they do offer counseling. And uh, although I, even I come from a background where counseling hasn't necessarily helped. Having the option there is good because not a lot of people do. So that's always yeah. something to remember. All right. Yeah. Let's take a quick break and then we will move on to Meredith. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low price, full featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A R C H W A Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash atheist nomads. All right, Meredith, you're up. Let's keep this happy train rolling. Oh, yay. I'm so excited. The happy train is about to derail. <laughs> <laughs> I suffer from um, depression and uh, general and social anxiety. Um, and they didn't really pop up until I was in adulthood, probably stemming from stuff that went on through my childhood. I didn't have the happiest uh, family life growing up, as I guess some of us, most of us didn't. Um, my biological parents, my mom and my dad, uh, fought a lot, and I don't think they had a very happy relationship. So I had some issues coming out of that. I also think it was hereditary, though. Like, I know from the little bit I know about my biological mother, she died when I was 12. Um, so I didn't get a chance to know her very well. But I do know that she also suffered from anxiety and very severe depression, which mine isn't that bad. But I remember she'd have days where she literally just couldn't get out of bed. She couldn't leave the house. She was just very stuck. And luckily, mine's not been that bad. I also went through a pretty unhappy marriage. Um, and that's when a lot of my problems with anxiety started popping up. Um, and he was not supportive at all. Um, he would tell me that it was all in my head and, you know, perpetuate all these myths about how mental illness is just this fake thing that you're just making it up and it's fine if you're just a stronger and a better person then you could get through it and I didn't buy into any of that at all Um, and I started on medication for anxiety probably about five years ago and I've gone through a couple since then Uh, depression hasn't been as bad for me recently well 
for a while it wasn't. It's it's due to some, I guess, work issues. It's popping up again. Uh, but I've been anxiety seeing is seeing that on Facebook. Yeah, I try and keep it at a minimum. It's just things are pretty sad and demoralizing and hopeless feeling right now with the situation there. <laughs> but um, an- anxiety is the big one, and I've been on a couple different medications. The one I'm on for it now seems to be helping the most with it, but it just it gets so bad that I don't want to go places. I don't want to be around people. I can't drive anywhere if I'm going someplace where... I've never been before. I have to like obsessively Google Maps it and figure out my route because I'm scared of driving places. I'm scared of parking. I'm scared of riding as a passenger in the car if there's traffic. That's a new one. That just popped out up about a week ago. We tried Wesley, to go up what did to... you do to make that happen? <laughs> he didn't do it. <laughs> I'd blame that one. Yeah, the, the traffic was really shitty. It was backed up. It was bad, and I just a lot got... Of stop and go. I got terrified of, of being in traffic. Um, and... I don't know, like my chest just hurts. And then, of course, I'll get into the spiral where I just start start thinking those anxious thoughts. And, you know, it just keeps going down and down and down. And it's bad. But having a strong support group and friends and people in my life that love me definitely helps better than, you know, people telling me it's not real. (laughs) And so... Obviously, you know, being medicated, you are getting professional help with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I haven't done counseling for it, which is probably going to be um, my next step. Uh, I started on a lower dosage of the meds I'm on now, and we upped it. We doubled it a few months back. But sometimes I still get really anxious and in a lot of pain. So next step is I'm going to try um, cognitive behavioral therapy for it if it keeps going the course that it does yeah and that's helped i mean hundreds of thousands of people just that that in particular yeah the other thing is probably just to recognize what in your life is causing the anxiety in this case i think it's largely based around where you work and um yeah probably looking to get out of that yeah (laughs) there are other jobs there are other places to be oh i know i know and that's not (laughs) For most people, they feel trapped where they're at job-wise, yeah. even if it's causing oh, yeah. them terrible misery. Um, so that that would be a hard one to overcome. But uh, yeah, yeah, I, I definitely look forward to seeing how uh, the cognitive behavioral therapy works for you. Yeah, I'm hoping that'll help. You know, I'm I'm actually a really big fan of like you know therapy and and pills and such for others. A better life through <laughs> chemistry. <laughs> Just not really for me. I was really scared to go on medication for a long time. I really felt like there was something weird wrong with me and that if I went on medication, I was like admitting defeat or that I wasn't weakness. Yeah. Showing weakness that I wasn't strong enough to overcome it myself. But that's such a silly way to think about it. If you had um, heart problems, would you be stubborn and be like, oh, I don't want to take medication for my failing heart? This chest pain will just, I'll just walk it off. Walk it off, you know, chin up. No, that's how you have a heart attack. Exactly. Just like that's how you have, you know, (laughs) a total major depressive episode. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Lauren, you're up. All right. Um, My umbrella is a little different shaped. Uh, I've been having depression and anxiety since as far back as I can remember. Um, I remember on my seventh birthday thinking I wanted to die. That's weird for a seven-year-old. Um, we had no idea what was wrong with me, only that I took things very seriously and I needed to quote-unquote chill out more, which um, don't ever tell me to chill out or just, just relax. Calm down. Oh, my God, I'll get so mad or at you. loosen up. Lo- oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> what, what about chillax? Can I say chillax? I had a friend trying to get me to loosen up that almost ended the friendship. She hadn't backed the fuck off. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. That's That doesn't help. Um, When I was 15, we moved from Meridian, where I grew up and was looking forward to uh, living. Meridian High School was had a bunch of 
t- classes I wanted to take, and Boise State was here, so all of that. And then we moved to Idaho Falls, which is a much more conservative area of the state. And um, we were non-religious growing up. So when my dad says there was a steakhouse on every block, I thought he was talking about Texas frickin' Roadhouse, not about Mormon <laughs> steakhouses, not about wards. I was very disappointed oh, at no. how little beef yeah. was available in Idaho Falls. Well, Texas Roadhouse <laughs> has really good rolls, too, so oh, that's definitely the, something to get excited bed. about. Yeah. <laughs> um, so for some reason, instead of just making friends, which I was okay at, I made up a friend and had an imaginary friend for two and a half years. That I About managed how to con- old were you? I was 15, 16 years old, 17 wow. by the time it ended. And um, basically, I convinced everybody at school that I had this friend that I met after, after school and spent my time with on the weekends. And then at home, I convinced my family that I had this best friend at school. So everybody thought I was doing really well. And then uh, the lie kept getting more and more complicated. And I'm actually rather proud, sickly proud of myself for keeping it going for two and a half years. Because <laughs> really? <laughs> you didn't see anything wrong with that, parents? But, um, <laughs> but I finally had to kind of kill her off uh, in order to, because I realized that I couldn't keep it going. And my best friend dying really messed me up. Um, even if she wasn't real, she'd been a part of my life for two and a half years. So yeah. once my sister and mom found out what was actually going on, what had been going on for years, uh, mom got me in to see a counselor, a psychiatrist, diagnosed me with depression, um, anxiety with secondary depression, and I've been on some kind of medication ever since. So that's going on 15 years now that I've been on um, some kind of medication usually affects her. Uh, I got a note. Did you give her a grand death? Uh, no, she killed herself because she had to move away and was miserable. Oh, oh no. So, no, yeah. <laughs> it kind of sucked. I guess it was like kind of my own yeah, it's secret like desires kind of coming forward. Kind of but I never thing. wanted to actually kill myself. I've wanted to crawl into a hole and disappear, but I've never actually had that desire to actually end my life. Just to hurt it and to cause enough attention that people would pay attention to me, I think. I was one of those kids who would cry during class so that people would say that they're my friend. I was one of those Aww. kids. Everybody hates those kids. But uh, I got through it, <laughs> mostly. Um, so for the past 15 years, I've been really uh, medicated into, you know, wellness. <laughs> for the past five years, especially, um, the past five years has probably been some of the happiest that I've ever had. I finally failed out of college, so I didn't have to worry about school. Woohoo! <laughs> uh, my jobs have been tenuous here and there, but for the most part, on the day to day, I'm doing just fine, and I'm actually quite happy. Um, what we've recently discovered here in the past three months or so is that the reason why I've been so happy and perky is because I've all of my anxiety I've been burying down and ignoring. Well, or just medicated past the ability to feel it. Yeah. Yeah, so I haven't, I haven't really had to deal with anxiety so much um, recently, and then it all finally came to a head, and uh, I had a pretty bad breakdown a couple couple weeks ago. Ugh, it's been like three months now. No, it was two months now. Almost two months ago. Yeah, and um, was shocked and horrified and incredibly disheartened at how little help was available. Uh, we had uh, I had a major breakdown at work called my husband, and he came and picked me up. Um, there was no place for me to go besides the ER. There was no mental Shit. health facility. Uh, my psychiatrist wasn't available until November 25th. What? So, yeah, they went ahead and gave me that appointment, but uh. a lot of good that did me. I couldn't get in to see my general practitioner for another week, and I couldn't get in to see a counselor for another week. So for a week there, I was just basically, I don't know, I just wasn't myself, definitely. It it ended up being about three weeks uh, until you got into the psychiatrist, which, of course, the one you'd been seeing prior to that had left the practice, and so you had to start over with a new one. Yeah, they they didn't tell me that, that my psychiatrist left. So I called in and said, okay, I need to see her now. And they're like, oh, well, she's not here anymore. Um, we can get you to see this other doctor 
in uh like about three weeks <laughs> no no well yeah that's exactly what happened basically i got the soonest um cancellation appointment i could get which was what two weeks later and uh finally got in but yeah for about three weeks there i was basically just it's just me and dustin trying to trying to keep me going i was going to work part-time if that um and it just it just has really opened my eyes to how little emergency help there is for people who have uh these kind of breakdowns um later i've i've come to learn that there is uh, a place called terry riley's mental health clinic that i could have gone to um but they tend to focus most of their help for the low income or underprivileged people and i am actually very privileged. So I don't know if I would have actually been able to get in. So you're left with an ER, in, um, usually an inpatient kind of situation, and my insurance doesn't cover that very well. So that was a no-go. Well, and if you had reached the point of, you know, me having to take a knife away from you, you would have been at the ER. Yeah. I mean, at least they can sedate you, but that's all that they would have <laughs> been able to do. Yeah. Yeah. But I finally got in to see the new psychiatrist. I told her exactly what was going on. She put me on some new medications, um, made some tweaks here and there, and I've been doing great since. Back at work full time. Now we just wait for the next one. And what was really interesting with that, uh, since Lauren was pretty out of it during much of that time period, uh, I was the one keeping track of what was going on. She had me come along to that appointment. Yeah, I couldn't remember squat. And it was kind of cool. The psychiatrist came to the same conclusion that I had, that it was work-related anxiety that had just been building. Uh, oh, man. I feel like I'm on the same road. Yeah, me too. Yeah. What <laughs> happened was that I reached my th the end of my three-month contract. And as a contractor, that means that I am eligible for hiring. Um, I was promised that this was attempt to hire, so I was really excited. It was uh, exactly 90 days later. I called up the uh, contracting business, said, okay, let's get this rolling. And he's like, okay, we'll call them tomorrow. The next day, we got called into an emergency meeting. Um, they canceled all the contra temporary contracts, except for the few that they couldn't live without. They cut everybody's pay wages, and there was a hiring freeze. Wow. So, Fuck a duck. Wow. They kept me because I am a certified coder. So, in, but instead of seeing how lucky I was that they kept me, um, I passed out for the next three weeks <laughs> mentally. Oh. <laughs> they they've been super patient with me and awesome and uh, and very forgiving so far. You know, three weeks of of only part time, less than twenty hours a week. And they've managed to hold on to me. That's that's pretty awesome. But yeah, that's not the news you want to hear when you think your life is about to take this big turn for the best. You yeah, know, especially after two years of being unemployed or underemployed, or not unemployed, but well, there was a brief period of that. But underemployment and temporary jobs that's that's stressful. Yeah, I have a lot of uh, anti corporate sentiments. Um, I work for Circuit <laughs> City. Oh, and I was there for that shindig. Yeah. So they were telling us, "Don't worry, we've got billions in the bank. We actually have be more fine. liquid cash than Best Buy does." Three months later, they shut the doors. Yeah, I worked for the Verizon inside of Circuit City, oh. so I saw all of that go down too. I didn't work there, but I had a lot of friends that did. And up until the very end, everyone was so optimistic and, "Oh, it'll be fine. It'll be fine." And then, nope. So the whole time I worked at Best Buy, which was about a year. Um, and I heard all the same stuff. I was seriously expecting the doors to close any day. So yeah. at no point when I worked at Best Buy was I comfortable with my job. Um, that and, you know, selling cell phones isn't exactly medical coding. <laughs> no. Uh, no. So the only way I was able to get back into my career was to do temp or contract jobs, which is a three-month promise with no, with a dot, dot, dot at the end. So... Yeah, lots of work-related stress, um, lots of hereditary stuff going into this. My dad, my grandparents were depressed. Uh, my mom has some pretty bad anxiety stuff that she's managed to overcome just through through will. But I needed a little extra help with that, and that's why I love pills. Mm -hmm. I love pharmacy. Big Pharma, I don't care how much I'm paying. Just keep the pills coming. And it seems like we got a, a good mix right now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, that and my dogs. I love my dogs. 
getting married that helped because that <laughs> took away that like what's gonna happen because he's the one that's kind of making the money <laughs> so i'm like mm, <laughs> should probably marry into this as soon as i can <laughs> <laughs> marry into some stability oh, I joke, I joke. I love you. <laughs> all right we're gonna take another quick break and then uh we'll we'll go through some I guess topical themes we love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com, tweet us at atheistnomads, send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads, or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. One theme that definitely... Uh, seemed to pop up was three out of four had pretty severe childhood issues. Um, Abusive parents, uh, in my case, uh, a lot of difficulty at school. So either my life sucked at home or it sucked at school and it kind of, you know, switched at uh, one point. Um, Yeah, I'm the only one that had a pretty good childhood. I think I was 12 or 13, and my mom made me stay awake and sit on a stool for a couple days. Whoa. Days? Yeah. She would let me off occasionally to use the restroom. She made me stay awake and just sit there. That was weird. Yeah, that's That's not nice. No, it's not nice. And it's just (laughs) weird. You know, where did she get these ideas? Uh, I guess God gave them to her, right? Yes. (laughs) Probably not Dr. Spock. I don't know. Just let him cry it out. But he's bleeding. <laughs> nope, just let him cry it out. <laughs> they, gotta, they gotta learn. We also have three out of four with at least one of our original parents um, being dead or easy to presume to be dead. Yeah, out of the picture. Yeah, my, it's pretty much, yeah, my mom's dead. My dad might as well be. I basically just don't have contact with him. So in that kind of situation, like I said, I don't, I cannot comprehend. I can't understand from your point of view what that's like, because I had two healthy parents that love me. What's it, I mean, is it better off that way? Just to, just, just to write it off and just say, okay, just no contact. Let's just build my own life the way that I want to. Or do you kind of want to reach out? Uh, <laughs> one of the things my family was always really good at was uh, disowning each other. <laughs> so, so, um, just passively aggressively not acknowledging, yeah, not, not talking to each other for years. Uh, like my mom, she had eight brothers and sisters, I think it was seven brothers and sisters to eight total eight. And yeah, there would, there would be like years or, you know, decades that they wouldn't talk to each other sometime. So, you know, extended family stuff like that. Uh, I was always kind of used to that. Uh, couple of us like uh, cousins and second cousins have have reached out in the last i don't know a few years but With the uh, invention of facebook yeah but uh you'll notice you know like my friends list is always maxed out but family there's like maybe five out of five thousand so i yeah i just don't socialize with with uh people that i'm blood related to and dustin you've got a pretty healthy relationship with with your siblings and your step siblings, mm-hmm. but dad, your biological father is still out I, of the I, picture. At this point, I would say presumed to be dead. Um, last con, last knowledge of his status was thirteen years ago. Oh wow! Uh, mm-hmm. And that was a combination of still getting. Um, disability benefits instead of survivor benefits from social security that stopped when I graduated from high school. And while I was approaching graduation, a PI from uh, the state of working for the state of Oregon, uh, tracked him down to see if we wanted to collect back child support. And my mom left that up to me. And my decision was no, Uh, it wasn't worth the risk of him coming back. Yeah, that seems pretty healthy decision. Let that one go, you know? <laughs> I, I had a, a fear throughout my teen years that at some point I would be very happy and successful and he would show up and ruin everything. I had kind of the same thing, but for a different reason. Uh, 
like I say, my, my dad was a bad person and my mom actually changed her name. We moved, uh, got a PO box, a whole bunch of other stuff. And so, you know, when there was like, uh, visits that we were supposed, me and my dad were supposed to have, we'd meet at like a restaurant or something like that. Uh, cause my mom didn't want him to know where we lived. And, you know, that's actually something that I've, my dad does actually have my address now, but it took me like about 10, 12, 15 years for me to give it to him. Um, yeah, you know, uh, just, yeah. I, is that weird? No, <laughs> no, no. From, uh, from what I understand when it comes to parents that are considered to be definitely abusive or bad, quote unquote, um, the less contact you have with them, the more of a individual you become. And that's a, that's a pretty strong and healthy thing to do to cope with the abuse. Now, if it was all lies that your mother had given you and the guy's actually really nice, that would be totally different. But I don't think that's the case here. Not, yeah, not a good guy. Yeah. How about you, Meredith? You had a biological mother and I'm assuming a stepmother? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So my mom had lung cancer and died when I was 12. And my dad remarried shortly after, and I gained a stepmother and a stepsister. Um, my stepsister is six or seven years younger than me, but my uh, stepmom was very religious. And this is when we all started drinking the Kool-Aid and going to Christian high school and our Assemblies of God church. And Oh, I um, bet it was everything your dad wanted. Your yeah. kids all straightening out. And- yeah, I was turning into like a good person, right? Except I wasn't <laughs> because I still wanted to listen to Linkin Park and that was the devil's music. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is, but not for the yeah, reason probably. that I thought. No. Um, but I never really grew super close to my stepmom. Um, I'm still not. We still don't get along. I don't get along well with my dad either. Um, a lot of that now is because of our differing religious beliefs, which that's a, I guess, not topic for this show, but just some backstory. My sister and I get along all right, my stepsister. Um, but I still, I don't have a lot of contact with my family, even though they're local. Um, and I, I do fluctuate back and forth. There's There's a part of me that feels like I really want to have a strong relationship with them and why can't we just be a normal family and all get along um but most of the time i just i don't want to have to deal with them because everything is so awkward and weird and i feel better having my family that i've chosen having wesley and having a good strong group of friends and that feels better to me than going through the anxiety of having to live up to these expectations that are never going to happen. Yeah, the the constant, constantly butting your head against the wall. Yeah, it's old. Yep. Yep. All right. Let's yep. uh, take a our final quick break, and then uh, we'll go move on to another topic in this discussion. If you like the show, consider giving us some financial support. To make it really easy with one-time donations or to support us on a per episode, monthly, or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon, find out more at atheistnomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. One dollar an episode is all we ask. Please think of the kittens. So the next thing I want to go into, because there, there definitely seems to be a, a again, three of us have a, uh, a certain set of experiences and Lauren is kind of left out. Seriously, I'm like Aww. such a nice, awesome, wonderful background person except for my mind. <laughs> you guys are the ones with the, pro- <laughs> with the problematic backgrounds. Gee, so thanks. What, what role has religion played in all of this? Uh, a major one. Major. That's where a lot of the problems started. I mean, once they got a divorce, I mean, my mom, my mom and dad, I mean, we moved up here to be missionaries, build a church. And so, you know, uh, God, church, all that was very important. Are Seattleites um, he- particularly heathenistic? Uh, yes. <laughs> I, I used to think so until I saw the, the football game a couple of days ago. Oh, man. But, um, oh, man. That aside, uh, yeah, God was always a major focus of the reasons why she was, you know, beating me or, or scolding me or mentally abusing me. So, yeah, big role. 
Yeah, Meredith? Yeah, I guess kind of just piggybacking off of the family relationship. Maybe sometimes I think if I would have been able to have that stronger relationship throughout my adulthood when I was coping with all this, like, anxiety and depression, that might have helped because I felt pretty isolated. But I couldn't do that because we had our, you know, I was agnostic at the time and my parents were shunning me for... um so I didn't feel like I had that support network to get any kind of help that I needed. And also, you know, you were just old enough, what, 13 when your dad remarried? Yeah, thir 13 or 14. It was right so, before high school. Yeah, so just old enough that it would have been hard to latch on to a new mom. Yeah. It and was it, a lot I mean, easier it was for like, me at eight. It was, a, it was a big move, too. Like, I grew up in Gig Harbor, and I was planning on going to high school with all my friends, and I had been friends with these people for a while, and then we up and moved to Renton, started brand new high school. Like, I just, everything that I knew was gone. I had to start all over. That is a, a really hard time for, I mean, there's no good time for a kid to move. No. But right around the 14, 15 year range um that was when i moved that was when my, my brother was only a couple years younger than i was and yeah. uh that shaped the way that we coped with a lot of problems some yeah. people chose uh drug use some people chose imaginary friends um some people chose just uh keep your head down and get your schoolwork done <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> and for me the role religion played was there was kind of the incidental aspect with the school I was going to when we moved to Grants Pass. So it was a small Christian school. They all assumed everybody came from good homes and was were uh, yeah. stable. The faculty was by and large inexperienced. I kept having, you know, it was two grade classes. I had a different teacher every year until eighth grade because the teachers were fresh out of college and got married and left oh. over and over and over again. My seventh and eighth grade teacher, uh, she also got married after her first year there, but it was to a local, so she stayed. It was very much a case of bullying was going on, and they didn't know how to handle it. My dad was on the school board. He was the finance <laughs> committee chair at one point, and... The principal couldn't even bother to acknowledge that there was a problem in his school. Uh, it was... Well, if you just ignore it, it'll go away, right? Apparently. <laughs> they graduate and move on sooner or later. It, it eventually did go away when I stopped uh, turning the other cheek and started throwing punches. Nice. Uh, I was seventh grade was when that kind of started. I twice uh, had, had guys come up behind me and choke me. They literally put their arm around me and start choking me. And I'd try to get them off. And as soon as I broke free, um, in both cases, they had bloody noses at the end. <laughs> well, they uh, kind of deserved it then. And when I started fighting back, also, you know, I was growing quite a bit. I, uh, before long, was the tallest kid in the, in the school. Uh, so that definitely helped. When you have a height and weight advantage on everybody by the end, uh, Nobody's going to mess with you, <laughs> but I don't remember you being that tall. Six, two. Okay. Yeah. Well, you're also pretty tall too. So it's a little bit more relative. And then the, uh, I'd say that the larger way religion played into all of this was it ended up being my escape. My, uh, I made a friend in Grants Pass and he left, uh, went to be homeschooled, uh, after the first year that, um, we actually had together. Um, other than that, any friends that I'd have would be my friend at times and my bully at other times. And so I receded into religion. You know, Lauren had a imaginary friend she created. I had one handed to me and Ooh, I dodged that bullet by four, uh, by 12. <laughs> when I got baptized, I had already read 44 of the 66 books of the Bible. I was, elected uh eighth grade class spiritual vice president uh and then that's a thing wow when my senior year came around and uh september 11 happened and thought 
we all thought prophecy was was being fulfilled. The end was very near. Uh, I believed my role in the world was to help with that. And religion definitely played into all of this. Uh, but it was more as, as an escape. It made it so that I didn't have to deal with stuff when it was happening. Well, I can kind of see that, you know, a little kid being bullied, and then you kind of learn about, oh, well, bad people go to hell. Adventists don't have a hell. Oh, that's right. You didn't have that satisfaction. Okay. Well, that's too bad. <laughs> they just don't get stuck going to a place I didn't want to go to either. Uh-uh. I never liked the idea of heaven. Uh, it just sounded like, well, kind of like hell. <laughs> eternity is sounds so long. fucking boring. Eternity is a really long time. I was like, uh, excuse me, sir, could you quiet down over there? I'm blissing over here. You're interrupting <laughs> my bliss. <laughs> How is the healthcare system doing for for each of you? Uh, shall I open the binder? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um I'm going to go ahead and take that one on right right away just because I've had yeah. very recent experience with it. Um, now, I'm in Idaho, and they don't put a whole lot of uh, importance on, um, well, just about any kind of mental health, unless it's related to, you know, somebody grabs a gun and it threatens to take their guns away. <laughs> they really just don't care. So there's no uh, emergency help. But once you're in the system, I think there's um, quite a bit. Uh, there's a lot of money to be made on mental health problems. So once you're in the system, like once I was actually, once I had a psychiatrist and a counselor, um, I could go in weekly or bi-weekly and get as much help as I needed. Uh, medications cost quite a bit, but most most doctors are more than willing to, to get you what you need. Um, but what was just really bad was the fact that there was lack of an emergency uh, access. That's what really that's what really kind of broke my heart. Um, yeah, that's really surprising and terrifying at the same time. Yeah, you shouldn't have to wait a month to go see somebody when you are considering hurting yourself. Mm-hmm. I mean, no, that's absolutely just, not. And uh, an ER visit? Sorry, that's just not going to do it. <laughs> yeah, well, it was terrifying for me the next day. I couldn't get Lauren to respond, and I called up the the clinic where her psychiatrist was at, and it took forty five minutes for them to call me back with any kind of guidance. And were they able to give you any good guidance? All it was is let her sleep. Wow. Which, with a depressed person, not great yeah. advice. No. What had happened was that they had doubled, uh, or they had upped the medication I had just been put on. So, um, and that medication was Seroquel. And anybody who has had Seroquel or has read about it online knows that there's this thing called the Seroquel hangover. Um, in smaller doses, it just means that you're really dizzy, nauseous, and can't function the next morning, uh, usually until about, you know, noon. But when you up it to the point where um, you get beyond that, it is used as a, a sleep medication. It basically knocks you out. And that's what happened when I upped my medication. It sedated me. So when he said he couldn't wake me up, that's what he's talking about there was the sedation from the medication. That was the only thing that they were able to do for me was I did a phone call to the doctor's office and I got a hold of a nurse and they told me to up the Seroquel. And that was that was all that they could do for me. Yeah. And so the only thing they had other than let her sleep was skip the Seroquel and go back down to the previous dose, at which point we were back to no changes since the the meltdown. Man, I hope that medication has like a do not handle, do not operate heavy equipment warning. It has so many warnings on it. It's it's <laughs> basically a bottle with stickers of cute little like things that could go wrong. <laughs> yeah, I actually did go for counseling and have medication when I was sixth grade, I think. Uh, that didn't last very long. Uh, I did get put on Paxil for a while and... I just got so foggy that I stopped taking it. Uh, I, I don't know what's worse, feeling horrible or feeling foggy. Because in the fog, you're like, well, I want to feel again. So what should I do to make myself feel again? And that well, can I, sometimes be worse. Yeah. I couldn't, well, I couldn't even function. I couldn't, I could barely think. So it, it was, it was really bad. Yeah. Paxil's, 
actually just about any antidepressant that they can give you um if you're under the age of 18 will have unknown side effects mm. <laughs> they they say basically it, it could cause you to kill yourself it could cause you to become a zombie or it might fix you we don't know good luck because your that. brain is some kind of alien form that most human biologists do not really understand when you're a teenager sure sure yeah and for me I got counseling in, in college. Somebody should have noticed that I needed it as, as a child, but that didn't happen. Um, so I finally got to it in college, freshman year, and it was provided free, um, 10 sessions free per school year. Uh, it was part of what the, the campus offered, and that helped a lot. But at 18, freshman in college, you're not at the same place in life as you are later. And there's a chance that I would benefit from counseling now. I got a, a new doctor uh, recently, the prescription vitamin D. And after the normal buildup, I didn't respond as much as he would have liked to have seen. So I am still on prescription vitamin D and will get reevaluated again in a couple months. But that has helped a lot. It's at least taken, I'd say, drop the baseline anxiety levels from a four back down to a two. He also wanted me to get a counselor and I wanted recommendations because there are more than 200 in Boise and the two recommendations he gave me both focus on, uh, sex addiction therapy, which as we learned talking to Dr. Daryl Ray, that means run. (laughs) (laughs) They believe in woo. Yeah. Oh no. So I, I was getting more anxiety from wanting, looking at counselors, wanting to know what kind of a person am I going to be opening up to and what kind of, of help are they going to be giving that? Well, have you looked at any of the uh, secular therapists? Uh, I know there's that one group who does it. The secular therapy project. Okay. Yeah. The, you know, there's hundreds of them across the U S any yeah. in your area. Um, I don't know. It was giving me so much anxiety to think about it that I didn't even want to look. I was doing better without that. It's weird. It's counterintuitive. Yeah, Um, I know it's totally the wrong message. Mind works sometimes. (laughs) Well, what we ended up doing was we started doing right after work. We'd have a beer in the backyard. So he grabs a beer. I would grab a beer or a soda and we go in the backyard and for 45 minutes to an hour we throw the ball around for our dog and he would we would talk about our day talk about the anxiety talk about any problems at, at work sometimes we don't have much to say but that seems to be his counseling and um i mean there's not much i can do because i'm not trained or anything but having that listening ear that's basically been taken care of mm-hmm. uh we yeah. might be able to seek some uh Tr- you know, training on how to deal co- coping mechanisms for the moment, like when he's at work. But for the most part, I said, once we started doing that, your anxiety levels came way down. Oh, yeah. And it was something we'd been doing before, but we weren't as consistent with it. This is like a new movement, people. <laughs> Seriously, beer in the backyard time. So good. <laughs> and <laughs> one, other, one other issue with anxiety disorder is it has a tendency to where the anxiety is worse after the cause is gone and at that point there's nothing you can do about it it's there there's nothing causing it anymore you just have to let it pass yeah that happened with him with the wedding we got married yay three weeks later oh my god i'm still freaked out about it (laughs) so okay (laughs) well let's have another beer yeah which also is bad advice that (laughs) yeah not that i'm encouraging drinking as a way to solve your problems it's the relaxation and having someone to talk to that's good well you you guys have the the beer the pup and the talk uh meredith's taking up her own little thing oh yeah the coloring oh my god you're coloring the meditational coloring coloring. meditational coloring that's what (laughs) i like to do to decompress and that's a growing movement the it is books um, that are out there now for adult coloring are fantastic. Yeah, it's 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 turning into a pretty big thing, and there's been studies on it that it can help reduce stress levels, and it does. I I really enjoy it. Um, I 
a previous doctor of mine had recommended that I try meditation to help cope with my anxiety. He was a little wooey, um, but he did recommend meditation. I tried it and I just I can't turn my brain off to sit there and think about nothing like I have to be occupied with something and coloring gives me that kind of same like meditative state where i'm able to relax but because i have something to focus my brain on i'm not like running around i guess in my own mind yeah but i don't think most people can sit down and think of nothing yeah for an extended amount of time my attention span like, how do you do that it's like a gnat it's just it's everywhere um so that but the coloring or even the drawing, I've seen people who take up yeah. like henna tattooing. Um, they do those swirly little fantastic illustrations that could later even be turned into a coloring book. People who do that, they do the same. They say the same thing. Yeah. I started out before I got a coloring book. I was doing my own drawings and co doing them in pencil and inking them and coloring them. But it was a lot of work. And sometimes I just can't be that creative to draw a thing. <laughs> Yeah, I, I need something just already there for me that I could just color in the lines. Now, I brought this up with Dustin. I said, we should we should try this out. And then he pointed out that with his type of anxiety, he would worry so much about the colors and <laughs> what it would look like in the end and dr being perfect. And, you know, does he want to go with the, you know, what kind of tones does he want to use? Does he want to use shading? I mean, that totally ruins the whole point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So obviously it works for some people and not for others. But yeah. um, maybe the, fir the first thing you ought to do is just like draw through the line one time. Just, okay, it's not perfect. <laughs> Get that out of the way. It's like when you buy a new car, scratch it immediately. Go yeah. drive yeah. by a bush or something, and then you won't worry about just it. Just get it out of the way. Just get yeah. it out of the way. Because you don't want to drive a car like it's a brand new car for a year. It will ruin you. <laughs> And you, you won't have noticed that Scratch has been there for six months already, and you're still worrying. <laughs> so, uh, I've actually been able to, I've never called it meditation, but I've always been able to do it if I really think about it. Uh, ha -ha. Um, but, you know, it's as like self-hypnosis, just lay in the bed and, uh, you know, start with my feet, my legs, just relaxing my body as I go up and just pay attention to that and I always had like a thumbtack in my ceiling and I would just stare at that and I could just watch the wa the world just kind of shrink away and everything turn black and you know it, it <laughs> it's, it's called tunnel kind of, vision and it, it's perfectly yeah. normal and that is sure. actually how most people um, describe starting the meditation process yeah. you start with your your farthest away point on your body and you bring it inward my problem is i get from like like if i were to start with my toes by the time i get up to my belly i've already been distracted by 12 other things and i have to start over with my toes and then i get up to like the knee and then i'm like oh man my arm itches oh wait right, that's the wrong part of the body now i have to start my toes again <laughs> and then i'm like what am i doing i need to go to the bathroom and i'm hungry we should go somewhere <laughs> Uh, man, I could actually feel my blood like pulsing through me after a while. It was kind of fun. That's pretty cool. Mm. That's intense. It, it could have been in my, in my mind, but it still felt kind of cool. <laughs> All right. So we are running low on time. Uh, I guess the uh, my, last. My advice, uh, don't, don't, uh, don't, be a, don't pull a Wesley. Go to the doctor. <laughs> yeah. I, I think kind of the last thing I want to touch on is just societal viewpoint on mental health issues and i know i am mm -hmm. guilty of this as much as anybody else my father who i am happy to have no contact with was a bad father because of his bipolar now in his case he would be fine if he took his medication of course the medication also wasn't as good in the 80s but when he wouldn't medicate and he was very prone to not want to medicate so, like, dating, I had kind of a rule that if you've got mental health problems and you aren't taking care of them, um, you're disqualified. I also, because bipolar is genetic, uh, would uh, generally try to rule out the possibility of uh, dooming a child to bipolar. But... Uh, well, you can always just pull a Wesley and get a vasectomy. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. <laughs> but... It's, I think it's very much a, but it, like in my case, it's, 
somebody who has mental health issues that does something about it, that's why should that be any different than somebody with diabetes or heart disease? If they're taking care of it, they're going to, you know, be relatively fine. Yeah, there was that one point that you were worried about me. I had to go to a psychiatrist appointment and I missed it because there was a dog out on the road and I had to stop and help the dog. So I'm texting on Facebook talking about this dog that I found. I took to the Humane Society and, oh, I missed my psychiatry appointment. And Dustin's like, oh, my God, she's going to start making up excuses to not go. And I had to explain to him, it was like, no, it was because there was a dog. And I was really worried about the dog. That's all. (laughs) was the third appointment in a row that had been missed. And the psychiatrist was threatening to drop you as a patient. Dog. (laughs) <laughs> it was all wet and alone. The truth comes out. You got to save all the puppies. Oh my God, all the puppies. And but that yeah. was also just a few months before we got married. So I was, you know, w- when uh, you're looking at anything as, am I? can I deal with this for the rest of my life? <laughs> <laughs> I stop for all the dogs. And if I don't, I feel really bad for like the next hour. Societal views. Uh, any other thoughts to add on that? Oh, man. The gun control issue has been a bit of an, a double-sided coin with me. Um, one, people recognize that peop- these people who are doing these slaughterings um, are mentally disturbed. Yes, because no normal human being would go <clears throat> and kill or put in danger several people unless something was wrong. However, criminalizing mental health isn't the way to do it it really that's it's a way to avoid the gun control debate by blaming it on a group of people one percent of whom has committed an atrocity so when we try to bring up you know no maybe you really should just lock up your guns or maybe you should have less guns they're like nope nope can't take away my guns but maybe we should be more wary of mental health people with mental health problems Mm -hmm. it's like no yeah that's not the problem if that angle in the debate was along the lines of we need to improve mental health care in this country. Yeah. That would be cool. And And there was cries for that, but nothing ever came of it. And if it was along the lines of we need to make it more difficult to get guns. So in addition to background checks, we need to require mental health evaluations. I would be okay with that. If we had, because there have been enough mass shootings, it's not hard shouldn't be hard for a good team of, of psychologists to figure out the psychological profile of a mass shooter and, and, and screen I think for they that. have. Well, the problem They're, is that most shootings that happen in America aren't mass. They're people shooting, one person shooting another, and that person doesn't necessarily have any mental health problems. It's incidences of road rage and children getting into drawers and... But there are certain types of people who are... Some people are capable of road rage, others aren't. Well, like that guy in Roseburg was obviously not well enough to have a gun. Luckily, his mom had plenty. Hmm. I think there's still um, a lot of misconceptions in the general public around what mental health, mental health ish, illness is, like, and how it's treated and that it's not defect. And there is still such a big stigma around it. People just think you're crazy and there's a lot of negative connotations to it. Um, I think one of the ways to help that is just more awareness. And that sounds so fluffy. Like, how do you make people aware that this is a thing? I think we need to have another another march to the Capitol. I was going to say armbands. Armbands. No. Yeah, I need a little strong bracelet. Ribbons. Ribbons. Yes. A mental health ribbon. It's purple, by the way. Um, The tattoo is the semicolon. Yeah. But yeah, you're Is right. It really? Openly, mm-hmm. openly talking about it. It feels kind of weird because I've surrounded myself with people whom I love dearly, who all have mental health problems of some sort. So yeah. to me, it's like preaching to the choir. It happens every election season too. We're all like, "Yay, we're all going to go vote," and we vote, and then we find out the next day three percent of the population voted. Yeah. And I'm like, "Was it just us? <laughs> who are we talking to?" <laughs> We're just talking amongst ourselves. And um, if we can get a way to make it more obvious to everybody else, it would help me come to terms with the fact that it is a minority and help them come to, you know, come to the realization that that more minority is not, they're not freaks of nature. Yeah. 
that uh, I seriously doubt it's a minority anymore. I really do think that most people have some sort of diagnosable problem. Well, that's by design. The DSM uh, has, you know, thousands of diagnosable conditions and basically it's created so they can bill insurance for giving anybody counseling. Yeah. Chronic fatigue syndrome for those medical billers out there. <laughs> it's hilarious because we're not sure if it's real. <laughs> I All right. That, I just let that hang there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any final thoughts? <sighs> don't be a Wesley. Yeah. Unless um, you're getting a vasectomy, you don't then have be a to, Wesley. Yeah, you don't have to live with it. I have been, for the majority of my life, happy because I have had help. Yes. I recognized at a young age that it was a chemical problem with my brain, that there were pills out there designed to fix it. And for the most part, unless something weird happens, such as a weird job-related thing or a weird school-related thing, for the most part, I'm a pretty happy person, and I couldn't be happier with that. <laughs> That's my, my take. What about you, D? What you got? Everybody has, has issues. Um, well, almost everybody has, has issues of some kind. And Unless you're a freak. We, healthy people. We need to <laughs> normalize. normalize it. Uh, there has been a lot of good effort in recent years. I guess a big part of it is just how many people have been diagnosed with heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, and the like that, yeah, it's considered pretty normal. And nobody stigmatizes, any, stigmatizes anybody for health issues like that. Mental health issues should not be any different. In some cases, it's inborn. In other cases, we acquire it because of things that happen in our lives. And in also a lot of cases, people acquire it because of what they do for our country. That's not anything that should be stigmatized. It's something that should be treated. And especially friends, family, and employers should not look down on anybody for it, uh, especially if they're getting treatment. Oh, I was just doing my information awareness training in the uh, shipyard. And, uh, I just, uh, there were some questions that we had to answer, you know, as part of our practical exam and just found out that, you know, if we are, de uh, diagnosed as depressed, we have to report it to security. Whoa. Yeah. And our See, that's not an instance of it helping. Yeah. That, that's that... an instance of it terrorizing people. Yeah. But that's true with the military. You can't tell the military doctor anything without it going on your permanent record. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, so nobody huh. in the military is going to report any kind of signs or symptoms of depression, anxiety, PTSD until they are home and out of the military and homeless and can't get by. Yeah, so that that whole thing of like uh, being afraid to tell anybody because, oh, you could one be, uh, be labeled a security risk or to lose your job, you know, yeah, lovely. I'm sure there'd be a thousand lawyers that want to take that case. If yeah, that more or less. More or less, yeah. But uh, I just don't think so. that they would win. It's the government. Yeah. The government. Hey, come on. I am the government. I am the man. <laughs> you are the man. I can see you like standing in the doorway looking down on Wally or something. Like, I am the government. And Wally would just be like, meow. He's awesome and adorable. She, she knows this because I've done that. Um... <laughs> No, just, I, I agree with what everyone else has said. Um, don't be afraid to get help because you will feel so much better once you do. Don't feel bad about yourself or like you're not a whole person because it's just chemicals in your brain being weird and some of us need help with it. And that's totally okay to get help. Please get help if you feel weird if you feel like you need it. I feel so much better since I've been on my medication. Like I still have anxious times and sad thoughts, but in general, I can function as a person. I have better relationships with people and I'm happier. Yay. Yay. The side effects are <laughs> worth it. Yeah. I can't drink grapefruit juice, but I'm okay with that. That's <laughs> very that specific. Is 
It's one of the side effects of I'm on um, Buspirone, and if you drink grapefruit juice with it, you will basically fall the fuck asleep. <laughs> that is awesome. Wow. You're like insomniac. You're like, ah, I always keep a little flask of grapefruit juice by the, oh, by yeah. the table. Oh, yeah. I actually do have trouble sleeping. I should try that. <laughs> I mean, it's not like alcohol where it's going to cause some kind of toxicity problem in you, right? It's just grapefruit juice. Yeah. Yeah, just have a shot when you're trying to go to sleep. There you go. Just a shot of grapefruit juice. Just keep it in a flask. Talk to your doctor nope. first. Maybe ask your doctor first. Yeah. Because that would be weird if it did cause some kind of met- metabolic thing. So I'm thinking, doctor, I'm Orange thinking about self-medicating. Okay? Orange juice is fine. That is so weird. Grapefruit juice. I am fascinated. <laughs> wow. So, doctor, yeah, I want to self medicate. Thinking about taking some grapefruit juice. What do you think? <laughs> I love it. So, that's all we have for you, listeners. Uh, we will be back next week uh, with news. And I do want to thank uh, everybody for, for joining. Meredith, thank you for, for braving the microphone. <laughs> thank you. I'm excited to have been on for my first time. <laughs> first real live time. I know. Not incidental. Fun. Well, it was sad, but fun. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all we have for you, listeners. Uh, we will be back next week uh, with news. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads. And like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash atheistnomads. Please subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. The music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been The Atheist Nomads.